Empire. Hey babies, hey babies, hey babies, hey babies, hey babies. Hi everyone, hi everyone. Happy Friday, everybody. Getting set for preseason game number one tomorrow. Jets and Commanders. I am up um, in New York. Went to the joint practice yesterday. I'll give you some of my impressions of that in a minute. And we're obviously sticking around here to get to the high noon kickoff tomorrow. Preseason game number one. Jaden Daniels um, expected to start. I don't know if the weather is really, really bad. I guess they could have a change of heart about that because he did get a lot of time on the practice field against the Jets yesterday. Expectation is, though, he will start uh, maybe a series or two. That's probably about it. Marcus Mariota is expected to play, maybe get a series or two. And then the majority of that will then get turned over to all the younger players. Jeff Driscoll and the undrafted free agent Sam Hartman are going to take probably most of the snaps from there, probably from the second quarter on, if not sooner, um, depending how quickly um, you know the Jets give the ball back and how many possessions actually occur. I really don't think they're going to stretch it. I don't get the sense from Cliff Kingsbury or Dan Quinn that they're going to go stretch this in any way at all, um, even if there's kind of three and outs or really short series or anything like that. I think this is just to give everybody a taste. Um, secondarily, the offensive line is a little beat up right now, and so you know, best laid plans were probably to do a little bit more than what they – are going to end up doing because the personnel just isn't there. So they're going to run Jaden Daniels out there, but they're not going to have likely what would be the starting five. Very much in question is who the tackles are going to be. Andrew Wiley didn't participate in the joint practice. Neither did Brandon Coleman, the third round pick. They currently project as the starting tackles for this team. And so with either one of them not really being available, we'll see if they play or not, but I'm, I'm in all likelihood or not going to. How long would you want to keep Daniels? Daniels out there anyway. Um, center of the line seems to be kind of set with Allegretti, Biotish, and Sam Cosme, but Cosme missed a little bit of time earlier this week, did participate in the joint practice, but probably won't play a prominent role, or these guys won't play a prominent role, so I think they're going to go out there, get a taste of everything, put on the jersey, go through the pregame routine, run out there, run a few plays, days over with, come back in and turn everything over um, to them. As for the joint practice itself yesterday, um, it was sloppy because of the weather. It was pouring like the first 30 to 45 minutes of it. And then it was just kind of a steady drizzle from there, picked up again towards the late part of it. Fortunately, there wasn't, you know, a ton of slippage out there. Fields did drain really well. We didn't see a lot of guys slipping. You know, fortunately, nobody got hurt. Really, I don't think anybody on either side got hurt. So that was a really good sign that that happened. Um, the hard part for me to like give you my full take is they had two fields going at the same time. So the starting offenses and starting defenses were going up against one another and then the backups at the same time. So you kind of had to pick where you wanted to place your attention. If you wanted to see the offense at this joint practice, you had to stand up kind of over this overhang to kind of look down on it where the commander's offense was. And if you wanted to see the defense, you really needed to walk over to a separate field. So I actually saw a lot more of the defense than I did of the offense. And I'll tell you about that in a minute, but let me start um, with the O because it was a sloppy start from the point, uh, the parts that I saw. There was one really nice ball down the field from Daniels to Deami Brown, where he made this great one-handed catch. But the first couple of series that I kind of heard from and talking to my partner, Logan uh, London Fletcher, and talking to some of the other reporters like John Kime who were there, it was not a great start. Um, for the commanders in terms of having any kind of consistency. The offensive line, of course, was kind of a work in progress, but it was the first test to see how they would do, and that's a really, really good front that they got to face. The run game, which was a focus of the joint practice, um, had its moments, but it's just something that I think they're trying to figure out how to work on. I think they want to keep a, a lot of that under wraps, too, that they're working on very specific things with the run game, trying to keep under wraps what they intend to do once they get around to the regular season. Steve has gone out of its way not to show very much of what their formations are going to be or what they intend to do. I think they, they want the element of surprise. I don't blame them. Uh, they have this possibility with a completely new staff and a basically completely new roster. Why show anybody what you intend to do? Hopefully you catch teams like Tampa Bay and the Giants in the first couple of weeks off guard before you get some film put on you and then you see how you do when teams start to adjust to you out on the field. But the offense had a slow start in whatever they were trying to run. 
Having any kind of real consistency was tough. Uh, the Jets were able to break down the the protection pretty much. Um, it seemingly, at least initially, at will. Um, you know, again, you know, is this complete full speed? Not really. Obviously, there was no real tackling in this in the practice, and you can't touch the quarterback. So it still wasn't full on real football yet. But the early reviews of it were the offense um, probably has a learning experience from this as they turn into this game, and hopefully they can kind of build from there afterwards um two people i wanted to talk to specifically stopped to talk to the media one was terry mclaurin on just kind of an overall feel of where the offense was after their first date with a different opponent in a while so i felt like we made some uh good completions in 707 tried to take that in the team but yeah it's definitely good to go against uh, another team um they're a great defense. They're, they're well coached, and it, it was a good day of competition. How did the offense feel for you out there? Uh, it felt good. Um, obviously, we're just trying to execute the things that we've been doing back in Ashburn out here against different opponents. Um, you know, they play a, a similar scheme to uh, our defense, so we saw some you know similar looks and things like that. And obviously, going against uh, their their secondary and even their front, this is a good defense and a good test for us. Uh, but I felt like in these conditions, we completed a lot of balls, and we just got to look at the film and see what we could do better. wasn't live live, but it was close. What did you yeah. think of Jaden seeing some real action? Yeah, I think he did a good job of just processing. I felt like he did a great job of getting the ball out of his hands and making quick decisions. But that's what he's been doing all camp. It felt like he really uh, the game is starting to slow down for him even more. But even just coming in, he had a great feel of. Um, his ball placement, his anticipation, so I think that's uh, going to really set him apart. So uh, we're just going to continue to try to make plays for him and uh, the kind of guy he is. I know he's probably want some he probably wants back, um, but that's why we practice. So it's good to get out here against other people and, and kind of see where we're at. Terry, what's the focus for you guys from here to Saturday? Uh, man, just taking what we've been putting on the practice field on, onto the game field now. And, um, you know, I've been telling guys, no matter how many reps you get, you got to make the most of them. And this is the time where um, I'm sure you're you're putting film on for the, the commanders, but there's 31 other teams that watch this film as well. So you want to put your best foot forward and you want to make sure you're going out there and you can play free and fast. And the way you do that is knowing the scheme and uh, being confident out there. And I just feel like um, we're going to continue to clean up on the procedural things. We had a few false starts, but um, I think as far as executing the offense, it's getting better every day. Is there anything you learned? This is James' first time doing this. Yeah. Is there anything you learn about him, whether the way he was in the huddle, anything about how he responded, anything? Yeah, I just think he's been as consistent since he's been here he calls the plays well he gets us in and out of the huddle um sometimes when we go up tempo he's no he knows what he's doing and it just feels like he has a good feel of what cliff and the offensive staff want him to do and so um as you can see a lot of guys touch the ball which you know we have a lot of weapons so i think that uh will continue to be the case and i think he's just doing a good job of taking what the defense gives him but also uh when he has a chance to take push the ball down the field he's not afraid to do that did you guys view today as like a measuring stick because this is such a good jets defense and how do you think you're responding uh, I mean, I think it's just a good day to come out here and compete against another team um, in some conditions that, you know, may not be normal. But that's a good thing because, like I said earlier, like we're going to have to play in the rain. We're going to have to play in tough conditions and you got to be able to throw and run the ball. And so I feel like we did a good job of that in seven on seven. Um, the O-line did a good job. Um, you know, breaking some runs for us as well. And I think we were physical and uh, we, we played through the ball as well. You know, I mean, when guys catch the ball, we've just been emphasizing playing hard without the football. And I feel like those things are going to show up on film. That was Terry McLaurin. So then we got a chance to talk to Nick Allegretti, the, the current starting left guard of the offensive line. And, you know, with all of the things that have been going on the first couple of weeks with all the purposeful, fluid mobility of the players to kind of test them out in different positions into there was some attrition and some injuries that they had to deal with. Nothing seems long-term. There's nobody that anyone seems overly concerned about on the offensive line in terms of missing any kind of real time. Dan Quinn kind of talked about, he feels like that everything's just going to kind of solidify itself over the next couple of weeks as they get set for the regular season, barring any unforeseen circumstances. But Andrew Wiley was dealing with tightness. Brandon Coleman suddenly was missing a little bit of time. Cornelius Lucas had missed some time. And so there was a very fluid group that was out there, which made this kind of a bust a little bit. I mean, I really wanted to see how would those guys deal with being out there collectively together. And we're not going to get that taste of that until at bare minimum next week against the Dolphins, if everybody is back and healthy. So it was good to catch up with Allegretti and just kind of take his pulse on where everything was. I think it went well. And the, the fortunate thing for me is for such a long time, I've been in and out of the lineup playing right, left, center, wherever it was. So whoever's next to me, right and left, that is who it is. Uh, I 
try to do a good job of learning how they communicate, whether it's through practice or through meetings, um, so that we don't really have any, uh, any issues there. Um, and then as long as we are running the scheme, you know, the way that OG wants it, um, you know, Everyone's doing the same thing, you know, speaking the same language. The communication is pretty good. How did, how did you think? What did you think about Jaden? And I know you're not necessarily watching him, but in the huddle and the mechanics of everything. I thought he did a great job. Obviously, yeah. I, results of the plays, couldn't tell. It was just one of those. Like, I couldn't find the ball at the end of every play. Run, pass. It was a little, little chaotic there uh, playing against a new team. But uh, he did great. Having fun, which is important. Like, I came asked how the day went. And, He's just excited to be playing football, which is what you need. You need to love playing this game. There's going to be stress. There's going to be pressures. But if you're not enjoying it, it's really going to get to you. And I think he's got he's got a really good handle on that. How much of a challenge is it for you interior guys? There's a good amount of movement on the tackles. Uh, as I was saying, I mean, it's I'm used to it. Uh, I've played in and out of the lineup at a bunch of different spots. Um, you know, the hardest thing is probably it's games. That games are the hardest thing. Um, you know, being good with tees and knowing how your tackle is going to set. Um, but we all try to set the same way. Obviously, that doesn't happen. But we try our best to set the same way so that it, it is pretty seamless. And I think we have a, a pretty good group of experienced guys. So where it's not a, a huge change, whether it's Brandon, Luke, Trent, uh, over on the left, the three guys I've had, it's, it's been good. It's been a good transition. In general, with joint practices or, or preseason games even, how much do you, like, read into that when you go back and watch the film? Like, how much do you care about that? Uh, so this first joint practice, I was really excited for this because it was the first time that I got a shot to compete against ones because a lot, a lot of defensive line starters don't complete, compete in the preseason. So I compete against the first defensive line in only two and a half weeks after we started training camp. So it was a really cool challenge there. I was excited for it. Um, one-on-ones against the new team. Was, I was, guys, going into it, I was like, I'm just going to go throw my hands, see what happens. I don't know any of these guys. I know them a little bit, but haven't really broken down their film recently. So just got to go out there, threw my hands, uh, was confident with it. So I enjoyed it. I mean, the preseason game, it's a little up and down because a lot of a lot of starters on the defensive side don't play. Come from KC, everyone played. So I don't know what we'll do here. We'll figure that out probably later tonight. Um, but the joint practice, I was really excited for it. I thought it was a, a, lot of, a lot of really good work. Me and Ty had a lot of things that, I don't want to say clean up, but just – first time experiencing a couple of things so really excited to watch that film with him and figure out how we want to communicate those things but it was good all right so that's the story uh with the commanders and i'll have a lot more later on in the show for you as we kind of preview a couple of the position groups that i think are very much um up in up in the air uh in terms of competition and these preseason games over the next couple of weeks may shake them out specifically at wide receiver and corner but in the meantime all right of the games that haven't happened yet let's get into the preseason a little bit Atlanta's going to take on Miami tonight obviously we'll keep an eye on that because we get the Dolphins next week not that obviously the outcome matters all that much but first look at the Dolphins brand new defense they've lost a lot of attrition over there they let Christian Wilkins walk at all so there's a lot of a lot of different look over on them and then of course Atlanta you get the debut of Michael Penix tonight Uh, we'll see if how much Kirk Cousins plays if at all and then Penix who was kind of controversially taken in the top 10 by Atlanta even though they just signed Cousins to a four-year deal so we'll see how much Pettix plays and how he looks obviously that's going to be intriguing if he looks good down there Houston is at Pittsburgh Justin Fields is going to debut as quarterback one because Russell Wilson is not going to play um, in the game so that's going to be a very very interesting thing to watch as well Fields the reports are he's like shined in practice and Wilson who's kind of been just dealing with some you know low-end injuries it's not that big of a deal but will he outplay Russ and actually take the job I think we have to watch that very closely as this thing kind of works through um, the summer the Eagles are at the Ravens so first look at the Eagles off of a year where they totally cratered and the same week that there was a report about Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts not really getting along so they try to kind of revamp everything there have a you know run it back see if everything's going to go um, and the Ravens of course turning around here after a near miss for the Super Bowl losing in the AFC Championship first go for them with a slimmer Lamar Jackson so we'll get a look at him for the first time in the preseason whether he plays or not Bears at the Bills we're going to get the debut of Caleb Williams he did not play um, in the Hall of Fame game against Houston but
but is expected to go at Buffalo. So Caleb Williams, so we're going to get Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams. They're going to obviously face each other in the middle of the season, but we get to see the first looks of Caleb there. His former teammate, by the way, Olu Fashanu, is the first round pick tackle of the uh, New York Jets. We'll get a look at him. In the joint practice, he was not starting with the ones. Of course, he went to Gonzaga or at uh, Caleb Williams local. So eventually he's going to be a starting tackle there, but that wasn't the case, at least early there. Uh, Saturday, 4 o'clock kickoff, you'll get the Raiders and the Vikings with a couple of teams trying to figure out who their quarterbacks are going to be. Gardner Minshew, Aiden O'Connell for the Raiders. J.J. McCarthy, Sam Darnold for the Vikings. Saturday, 425, Green Bay is at Cleveland. Um, There's really not a lot of intrigue there other than still waiting on Brandon Ayuk. Would he go to Cleveland? Sounds like um, he wasn't overly interested in something like that. Tampa Bay is at Cincinnati. So first look at our week one opponent, the Buccaneers at the Bengals. So that's week one and week three opponents. So that one is we should put on the radar. Tampa Bay is the first game of the season. Giants at home is the home opener. Then we get the Monday night game against the Bengals. Saturday at 7 p.m., the 49ers, the IU trade thing, everything just kind of lingering over them. We'll get their first look as they take on Tennessee Titans in year two for Will Levin as their quarterback chiefs go to jacksonville and what could be a playoff type preview jacksonville i would still think is a front runner or a favorite maybe not over houston but close to for the afc south and the chiefs are the chiefs seahawks play the chargers on saturday night uh justin herbert is not coming back this preseason so you're going to see easton stick in what is jim harbaugh's debut as the head coach of the chargers seattle is a debut head coach as well uh with mike mcdonald the former uh, ravens defensive coordinator maybe we'll get a little look at sam howell some action there for the seahawks saturday saints at the cardinals uh, so we'll check that out. Marvin Harrison's debut should occur there. Denver at Indianapolis. We'll see a little bit of Bo Nix, although Sean Payton's been playing around with the depth chart, putting Jarrett Stidham as QB1. They'll take on the Colts. Anthony Richardson is back for Indianapolis after he injury-riddled uh, rookie season. Dallas at the Rams. So let's get a look at the Cowboys. A lot of lost players. Let's see what it looks like in week one for them. Rams, I think, are going to have a surprisingly pretty good offense. We'll keep an eye on all of that. And I'll revisit Commanders and the Jets later in the show. Bray Watch the Show, ESPN 630, the Sports Capital. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube TV. I'm sure by now you've all gotten back into your Sunday routines but they could be even better with NFL Sunday ticket and YouTube TV. You get the most live NFL games all in one place, every game, every Sunday. And you can even watch up to four different games at once with multi-view. One of my favorite inventions of this decade. It's exactly what you need to catch all the action, make your Sundays more magical. And also YouTube TV is great. I got it this year. It's awesome. Sign up now at youtube.com slash BS. Device and content restrictions apply. Local and national games on YouTube TV. NFL Sunday ticket for out-of-market games excludes digital-only games. Time for Spirit Spotlight for the week. And believe it or not, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but the U.S. women's national team might actually be exceeding expectations in the Olympics as Mike Minnick joins us again. He's been working with NBC, of course, as one of my partners in the broadcast booth for the spirit matches. We're just a couple weeks away from resuming the NWSL season, but they got one more match and it's for a gold medal this weekend. Mike, are, are you surprised that the U.S. women's national team is playing for the gold this weekend? A little. I, like you said, I think the expectations were a little bit lower. That if, if they met, I think people would have been like, okay, well, that's about what I expected. But this group has, has played well, and it's been that front line, right? You put Mallory Swanson, Trinity Robbins, Sophia Smith together. Anybody that follows this league knows that's a pretty dynamic trio. And this is the first time they've really played together for the national team because of injuries, because of other things, and they've been great. Um, I want to go back a couple matches ago because they've won two one nil matches to get to this point in the knockout rounds. They scored both goals late. And of course, the one two matches ago against Japan was Trinity Rodman. And once again, um, just elevating herself. I'm not I think it's because the team hasn't had the success that they've had in recent years. 
but elevating herself as a superstar on this stage again. And the goal was spectacular that she scored against the Japanese side. Yeah, and it's the kind of goal we've seen Trini Rodman score a lot for the spirit of the national team, right? You start on the wing, you cut inside, you get an angle to shoot, you get a step on the defender, and you finish. And that's what she's done so well for club, and now she's doing it on the biggest stage for country. And again, I, I, there was some question going into the Olympics if she was going to start with this group, but I always felt like it was a no-brainer because if you're playing a three up front, she's the perfect player to have in that wide role because not only gets she attack well, but she can really track back and be physical and defend too. Uh, this is, I, I would hope that this is really the beginning of a run for her as a superstar on the national team. She's only 22 years old and the next world cup is around the corner. And then the next Olympics, she'd only be in her mid twenties. I mean, there's a possibility here that she is going to elevate herself amongst the greats of the U S women's national pantheon. I hope, I mean, I don't want to put too much on her, but like this has been, I don't think for us personally, cause we get to watch her a lot. But I think globally, almost a coming out that she is the star of the United States women's soccer movement now. And I think the exciting thing, too, is, as you said, kind of looking down the road, it's going to be an Olympics here in four years in L.A. There's going to be a World Cup probably here in five years in the United States. She's going to be hitting her prime right when there's going to be a lot of really big spotlights on the U.S. women's national team. Yeah, it, it is. Um the other player I just want to focus on just for a moment, it's not a spirit player, but um, I remember when we were getting prepared to do the spirit match against San Diego, and you said to me, I think Naomi Gurma is the best defender that this team has, and it's not close, and she was spectacular here over the last couple of matches as part of the defensive effort for the United States as well. And and seeing her live, that's the first time I've, I've seen her live in the pros. I saw her play once or twice in college for Stanford, but it's like she's a play ahead always like watching the spirit game. There's so many times where, Oh, the wind was there. All of a sudden, Andy German's in it, or, Oh, there was an angle to shoot. All of a sudden she's right in front of it. She's so good at anticipating. And then not after, not just anticipating, but then stopping what she saw and not allowing a chance to happen. Um, so what do you make of the defensive effort as a whole not having given up a goal here in the quarterfinals or semifinals. I think I might have said it to you, but I know I said it to some people around a couple, in the last couple of weeks. I think the U.S.'s advantage in this tournament going in was goalkeeping. Alyssa Nair is a proven quantity. She's won a World Cup. She's in great form for Chicago in the league. And I, watching the other teams in the tournament, I was like, ah, I don't really know if they've got a goalkeeper that's playing as well as Alyssa Nair. Now, Germany and Katrin Berger had a great tournament. The Gotham FC goalkeeper, she was fantastic. But, you know, Spain had an own goal where Katja Koi hit it off her own defender and, and gave Brazil the lead. I felt like France's goalkeeping was kind of shaky. Their goalkeeper actually got hurt in the group stage. So I feel like the U.S.'s advantage was there, and that's proven. And then, as you said, you've got Germer playing one in front of her. You know, Tierra Davidson gets hurt, and Emily Sonnet steps in and plays well. Emily Fox has had a great tournament. Crystal Dunn, who I think got a lot of heat for not having a great World Cup last year, is back to being Crystal Dunn on the other side. The defense has been really good. Okay, so give me a preview here. What do you expect in the gold medal match for the United States? Well, I think that the U.S. being a surprise in this final is a surprise. Certainly Brazil being in the final is an even bigger surprise. A team that, that was kind of lightly regarded. You know, Marta's on the back end of her career. They really have not found a player to her level. They left Dabinia, who's really good and scored for Kansas City in the Summer Cup semis this week at home. So it was a question mark of, will could they get some players like Caroline, who was the league MVP last year before she tore ACL, get her back to form in time? They've been really good. And I saw Spain twice in this tournament. I worked a couple of their games. I was like, well, they're, they're not playing as well as I think, but I still feel like they're better than Brazil. And Brazil came out and just absolutely swamped them. We're up 3 nothing at one point won that game four to two. And now you've got Marta coming back off that two game suspension of her red card and her last Olympic. She has said, this is going to be it. So her last chance to beat the U S in the Olympic final, she's tried and failed twice. So she'll get her a third chance against the U S this weekend. Okay. Um, let's focus in on the spirit for a minute. We haven't really had a conversation about them. They have been training. They have been participating in these summer matches. Um, I, I don't know how close you're following it because I know you've been tied up, you know, working on all the Olympic stuff, but what's just kind of your general uh, take on what's going on with them as we're in the middle of this Olympic break? 
So I really thought the Summer Cup was about experiments. They they won one game uh, to open up against U.S. Guadalajara. They lost to golf and really didn't play well, really experimented with, with some lineups. And then had a really good game against Chicago down in Richmond last week. Lost that game in the back and forth from third by one. But there was a lot of experimentation. Like, for instance, Brittany Radcliffe was playing outside back in one of those games, just to kind of see how that would work, where, okay, if we need an outside back, if we need someone to kind of attack, how can Brittany Radcliffe do? So really for Jonah Heraldas, I think it was just about kind of seeing what he has and also seeing what he has when you don't have Trinity Robin or Hal Hirschfeld or Corey Bethune or, you know, the Tracy Kruger, these national team players, who steps up and kind of plays well. And I think there were a few players that, improve their stock. Lena Solano, I thought, had a really good tournament at forward, scored a goal. I think she might be someone that we'll see more and more as a sub. And then, of course, we'll see how these international players come in. You know, a couple have been training with the Spirit leading up to the season resuming. You're going to get Lacey Santos back from a really good run by Columbia in the Olympics. So I'm really excited to see how the new players kind of mix in with the current players who are playing very well. And uh, last thing, um, so if the United States wins and if Rodman has another shining moment, she's going to be on the today show and she's going to be on the tonight show. And she's going to come back here with, I think a lot more hype that is going to follow her because of what she did. And then couple that with, uh, you know, the new coach permanently takes over here and his record will start coming into focus. And it is astronomical what he did. And of course he coached the last match before they took the break, but I think people are going to start to realize there's something really special that might be happening here. I don't know if it happens really quickly, but there's going to be a tremendous amount of momentum behind this once they get going again. Yeah, if Jenna Geraldo wins an NWSL, you can make the case he's the best club coach in the world. With what he's done at Barcelona and success there, to go over and do that in a second league, that really has not been done. So if he comes over to Washington and, and you know takes over a spirit team that already is playing extremely well, and third place hanging into the break and wins another championship, then, then you're looking at, you know, maybe not Guardiola levels, but that kind of level on the women's side where it's someone who's acknowledged as a genius who can do little to nothing wrong, and any team that he coaches is going to be a title contender every year, year in and year out. Yeah, it'd be fun for us. I wouldn't mind yeah. it. So, <laughs> it'd be fun to watch those matches when they get going. All right, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks when the NWSL picks back up and the spirit are back together and back home. Mike, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem, Bram. My pleasure. Back to the Commanders and Jets after this. Bram Weinstein Show, ESPN 630, the sports capital. All right, welcome back. Let's uh, get back into the Commanders and the Jets. I want to on one of the position groups that has really stood out to me and I think is going to be put to a test here on Saturday. As Dan Quinn had kind of noted throughout the week, um, the starters or the people who are kind of prominently placed at this point, and I think a lot of things are still kind of up for grabs um, in terms of position groups and who's going to start and play prominent roles for this team. But the ones that like, at, let, let's just take the receiver group. Um, Terry McLaurin's the number one receiver here. Jahan Dotson's going to easily make the team and be the number two. Luke McCaffrey was a very high draft pick, although I do want to see a lot of him tomorrow because he hasn't really stood out specifically in practice at this point. That could be partially out of just lack of opportunity. Could be, but here's an opportunity he's going to get because Terry and Jahan and company are not going to play very much tomorrow. It's already kind of, we're, we're under the impression that Jaden Daniels and the quote unquote starting offense We'll get a series or two, and then Marcus Mariota similarly, and then things are going to get turned over. And that's why I want to focus in on the receivers, because Terry, Jahan, Luke McCaffrey, I think Olamide Zacchaeus has really elevated himself um, over the last uh, couple of weeks and into the, and he's looking like someone who's going to play a very prominent role here. Deami Brown, I think, is one of those we have to watch very closely here as a carryover. High level, high ceiling, made a really great catch in the joint practice the other day in the rain up at Florham Park. Um, and, you know, is someone that I, I just kind of gut feel, believe he'll make the team, has stood out. And I just kind of personally want to see one more go around with him. I know it's going to be like the fourth time, and I know it's another different coordinator again. 
But I think in this offense, let's give him one more shot because of kind of the high end talent. Like what would be the point of replacing him with somebody else? Um, So I think he makes it here. Well, that's five. That would lead you to believe that the bottom end of the receiver group, you know, assuming you keep six. um, Well, currently right now. That would be Jamison Crowder, uh, who would probably make the team because currently he's the number one in primary punt returner. I'll get to some of the other people and the cases they would make to challenge him for that spot or challenge Brown for a spot because the others seem very safe to me. But earlier this week, I had a chance to catch up with Jamison Crowder. You started your career here, yeah. played with the Jets. Yeah. What's it like walking back into that stadium, MetLife Stadium again? Uh, I mean, it's always a good feeling, man. Like, I'm not really superstitious like that, but MetLife is always one of the stadiums I've always kind of had some success, like had some really good games. Uh, even when we played against the Giants there and, and my, you know, my, doing my time with the Jets there, I would always have a really good game there. So uh, it's a place that I'm, that I'm very familiar with and, uh, you know, obviously excited to go back up there um, to Florham Park and, uh, you know, I have a joint practice against the Jets, man. You know, I enjoy my time there um you know always a lot of love to the Jets um they gave me another opportunity to showcase my ability so I'm excited man excited to go go up there this week you were here you were there you're back here how would you kind of describe your career at this point um right now man you know just still trying to get it you know what I'm saying I, I feel good man um you know going into your 10 is crazy to say yeah. that um but I feel like I've overall man I've had uh, 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 a pretty good career, you know what I'm saying? These last few years kind of dealt with an injury here and I broke my ankle when I was in Buffalo. Um, so that kind of kind of ended my season there with the Bills. Um, that was kind of tough on the mental, but you know, I'm just still trying to showcase that I can go out here and play, man, and obviously be, be a help to the offense, you know, moving the sticks, things like that. I feel like the game is much slower now to me. Yeah. Um, I can find the spaces, find the places to, you know what I'm saying, to be a, a, a very friendly receiver to the quarterback. So that's where I'm at. How do you view the competition in the receiver room and how important is special teams for you as you move through this summer? I mean, it's very important. You know what I'm saying? That's still a, 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 a thing of value that I have. Um, you know, so I'm just going back there and be able to field punch and, you know what I'm saying, be able to get yardage on the punt return to help, you know, just, you know, the main thing is that when they say get the first team, we get 10 yards, anything past that is great. So I feel like I still can do that at a very high level. Um, and obviously that's the way that I know that, you know, I, I can make this team. So uh, that's something I still value. And, uh, and obviously on the offense side of it, like I said, I still can give value. Uh, a guy can go out there and help move the sticks on offense as well. We haven't seen a lot of the offense. What do you like about it as you guys are building and getting ready for the season? Um, I think that it gives the guys um, opportunities to, you know, showcase what they can do. Um, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of more of a, a up-tempo type offense. So, you know, we get on the ball, get lined up, and, um, you know, play after play. I think that it helps. It can help a young quarterback obviously because you know with the tempo defenses can't really get into their disguises as much so that's the thing i think i like most about it and i'm just kind of looking forward to see you know how how, how it fares against you know other teams other competition hey last thing uh Jane daniels is going to make his debut you've been in the league 10 years you've seen quarterbacks of all levels across the range yeah. where is he right now as he ends as he starts his first game i think he's in a great spot i mean i, I feel like man through our count man you see it on film man, he makes great passes makes great decisions um, accurate passes, and uh, I think that you know games and this joint practice is really going to be a uh, it's going to be huge for him. You know what I'm saying? A good good opportunity for him to go out and, and, and see what it's like going against other teams, and uh, it's something that's going to be the start of you know a great things for him. Jameson, good luck this season. Appreciate it. Thank you. So Crowder's been fighting for a spot. Recently, the team uh, released Dax Milne, a former draft pick, and picked up Byron Pringle, who remained a free agent after. Being a spark plug for this team a year ago, obviously had a relationship from his Kansas City days with Eric Bieniemy. They brought him in. He's he is a hardcore player, good special teams player, can help on returns as well. And it kind of fed like or felt like that if he's going to make the team, he's going to make it over Crowder and would have to be a return specialist if they don't turn, say, Emmanuel Forbes or Jahan Dotson into their returner. Um, and then there are a couple of young guys that really need to be pointed out here, both carryovers, both guys that are back end of the roster that have had some opportunities in camp. And in the case of Mitchell Tinsley, a little bit in games, Tinsley, former Penn State player, has shined in camp, but he's going to have to really do a lot of work to probably make a name for himself to make the team. And therefore, tomorrow and probably next week and the week after are going to be his opportunities to make some big time plays to try to make a case for himself. The other player is Bryson Tremaine. 
Um, and in his second year, he's got a bigger frame and he has made catch after catch over and over and over, um, over the last few weeks. And so I think he is someone that I want to watch really, really closely here because this is, um, a, a, a competitive spot where he may win himself a job by making just too many plays to overlook or um, you don't want to lose him post waivers because he makes too many plays on film, but he needs to do it in the games and not just do it in Ashburn. And recently I had a chance to catch up with him. It's been hard to miss you the last couple of days in practice, making big catches from multiple quarterbacks. How's camp going? It's going well. I'm having, you know, I'm having fun. Um, it's great being out here with the guys and, you know, DQ has put, a, put together a good camp and it's been real competitive which is always fun for all the guys because we're so competitive um so I'm having, I'm having a good time it's funny it's watching your teammates run down the sideline after you make these big plays yeah. like what, what does it mean to you I mean I think that's the coolest thing to see when you cut back on the tape and you got guys like Terry and Ozzy and Diami and Jahan you know celebrating um everyone else because you know it's I feel like you know it's easy to celebrate yourself but it's cool to see other people celebrate um other people and I heard you talking to some other reporters about Terry McLaurin and, and maybe some of the advice that he's lending to you. Could you kind of talk about that from last year to this year? Like, what are you two talking about? Yeah, he was just saying, he was, he was telling me he's seen my growth from last year to this year um, in making those big plays. And he was, and then he's saying, okay, now we've seen you make the big plays. Can you do it consistently um, tomorrow? And then the next practice and then the next three practices and just keep making it more and more consistent because a lot of people can do you know big plays once or twice um, but the best guys like Terry you know they do it consistently every day and then on Sundays. So what do you do you watch him do you watch others where does the consistency consistency come from and, and how do you want to become more consistent in your game? I think the consistency yeah the consistency comes from you know everything watching film uh, out at practice uh, your your routine in the morning, you know, are you catching balls, you're on the off day, what are you doing? Um, and then it comes down to just making the play um, during practice or during uh, the, you know, preseason games of the game. So that's how the consistency develops. In, in your situation, you know, a new staff comes in, it would be very topsy-turvy, who knows, but you've got your receivers coach back. Yeah. So how important was that to have Bobby in the room with you, working with you, advocating for you? It's really cool. You know, I love I love Coach Bobby, um, and he, you know, it's it was it was nice to you know have him as a uh, coach last year coming in as a rookie, and then them still keeping him, you know. Uh, so, you know, just being able to continue the growth instead of having to like restart with a new coach, and maybe he's giving different advice. Um, so it's it's been really good for me just to continue, and you know he's advocating for the same thing, just being consistent. Um, and then making the plays when, you know, your name gets called. From year one to year two, what did you learn? What are you doing differently this year as you try to make this roster? Uh, I think just just playing faster, not, you know, not thinking as much because, um, you know, we've done so much work through OTAs and in training camp um, with the playbook that, you know, it's really allowed us to play faster. So I feel a lot more comfortable out there. Um, you know, I'm not thinking as much when I get to the line. I can just go. So what do the next three weeks mean? It, it's got to be pressure packed. You've got these preseason games, a few practices left to make your case. Yeah, no, it's 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 good. You know, I, I like the, you know, we're gonna get into joint practices and it be you know, a real competitive atmosphere. And then yeah. you get to the game and it's you know, it's the most competitive it, it'll get. Uh, so I'm excited for it. Um, I feel like you know our coaches and myself, I've prepared for it. So I'm kind of just treating it treating it like you know another practice and then in the game I'm just gonna fall back on my training yeah I mean the reality is the numbers are the numbers five or six receivers make the team you know some of the players that are definitively going to be on it so the numbers are slim so what do you think you have to do over the next few weeks to make the case to say I need to be one of those five or six that make this team I think I just need to make the plays that are you know you know when my name is called and you know I'm on that backside or that ball gets thrown to me I think I need to make those plays and um, just do it consistently throughout this preseason and this training camp and preseason, um, you know, and that'll, I, you know, I'm gonna do my best to make my case and, yeah. you know, where the, where the chips fall, they fall, um, but I'm just gonna go hard and then 
whatever happens, happens. I hope we get to see a couple of those big plays in practice up in New York or in Miami yeah, because <laughs> it's been something watching you out here the last few days. Thank you. Yeah, yeah me too. I'm, ex I'm excited for it. All right, Bryson, good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The other position group I really want to focus in on uh, for tomorrow is the corner group. I think it would have been great if we had an opportunity to see Aaron Rodgers. That's not going to happen. Or at least have gotten a look at him in the joint practice that occurred um, on Thursday. But unfortunately, because of the rain, the Jets decided not to put Rodgers out there and risk him. Um, and so, unfortunately, we're not going to get a chance to get that test here. But the corner group, you know, let's see if Garrett Wilson and company play. But the corner group is one to watch here very, very closely. It hasn't been as fluid as I kind of thought it would be, unlike the offensive line. And now with all the injuries, it's remained a very fluid position group. I thought there would be kind of more of a Wild West competition at corner. But if you watch what's happened in practice the first couple of weeks of training camp, it has not been that way. Uh, Emmanuel Forbes and Benjamin St. Juice have largely run out there with the quote-unquote ones. Mike Sandistrol is kind of a day one walk-in slot corner. For Forbes and um, for uh, St. Juice, they've been battling against a veteran, Michael Davis, who's come in here and he's trying to elevate his game. And then there's a veteran, Noah Igbenogany, who had played in Dallas, former first-round pick, bounced around the league, but played in Dallas with the this staff. And so he comes over here, and he stood out mainly in the slot, but potentially could play outside. And so I think this is a group that we need to watch very, very closely. For Sadistril, he's really made a name for himself. Will he end up being the what they call the slot or star corner? Uh, that seems the most likely. Would they potentially work him a little bit on the outside if they don't believe they're getting enough production out of St. Juice or uh, Emmanuel Forbes? Maybe. That's an open question. I'm more likely to believe that Sandistro will stay on the inside. However, Igbenogany has shown the potential to stay in there as well, which gives them options. After the joint practice, uh, we got a chance to catch up with Mike Sandistro. Uh, a chance to hit somebody else and go after somebody else for the first time in camp. What was that feeling like? I feel good just to you know see what other guys, other teams are doing. Watch the film on somebody else, um, and then just being able to, you know, use the techniques you've been learning all summer, and finally, you know, put it on tape against somebody else as well. The, the weather wasn't the greatest. How does that affect the way you guys play at all? It shouldn't really. You know, you can only control what you do. The weather doesn't matter. Um, so you know, rain automatically puts a mindset of run game. You know, pads going to be popping, but uh, you know, they were still throwing the ball. So regardless what the weather is, you still got to go out there and you know execute your game plan. Were you looking for a chance to go against number eight? I was, you know, that's a Hall of Famer quarterback, but I did get to talk to him after practice. The uh, little kid in me is really happy right now, so I appreciate the words he told me or the advice he just gave me. Could you share some of that? Uh, he kind of was just giving me tips on how to read quarterbacks and, you know, um, you know, just what they're looking at from, you know, the offensive standpoint and, you know, how guys are lined up and just what helps them pre-snap. Since this is all a learning process, what were some of the maybe teach teachable moments for, for you out there today? Um, I think just understanding, like, all right, we're playing against a new opponent or practicing whatever. Don't forget what you've learned. Like, don't let the moment be too big. Don't, you know, be too excited just because you're finally going against somebody else. Just go out there, breathe, you know, understand what's going on. <laughs> don't get overhyped and just, you still, like I said, just execute your game plan. How was it Jamar? getting to see some different route combinations out there today compared to what you've been seeing since the spring? Yeah, it was good. Um, you know, they had some good concepts in there, some, you know, stuff that gave us challenges. So I think the best thing for us is being able to go back to the film room and see what they did and just learn from it. So the corner spots worth watching here. So the unofficial depth chart came out and Emmanuel Forbes wasn't put as corner one, even though he has largely been treated as corner one throughout this entire process. And so it does lead you to believe that there is a, a big time open competition that is going on right now. And I'm not surprised by that, that we have this open competition. Michael Davis will probably get a little more run as a veteran than some most of the other veterans will. But let's see how he performs. Does he overtake either Forbes or potentially St. Juice? Is it possible that Forbes and St. Juice aren't even the starting corners, but that's how they kind of started in coming in here? I don't think either in any real danger of not making the team, but I do think it is worth looking into 
how long will they actually remain kind of at the front of the line of this group? And there's a couple of others that we'll just kind of keep an eye on here. James Pierre has been around the league. It's a name to watch. It's another veteran that's out there. He's got a lot of pretty good speed. So as a backup, he'll have a chance. He'll be fighting against guys like Tariq Castro Fields, Caillou Blue Kelly, Nick Whiteside, who's a carryover. All three of those were late acquisitions by the Rivera group. And we'll have to see if, if any of them end up sticking here right now. Now, it appears as if Davis, St. Juice, Forbes, Igbenogany, Sanistril will be the five corners that would be here. But some of these younger guys have a chance to kind of overtake them. And Forbes is the one, I think, obviously, that is really, really, really in question. Like, is he legitimately going to be a corner um, that they count on to put out there um, whether it's as a starter or as a primary backup they've kind of hinted that they've trying to find other things he could do like be a punt returner Um, they've utilized him on that so he is one to watch and I think this summer and really this next week the game against the Jets and the practice and game against the Dolphins are going to be the telling tale of where he is in the coaches' minds of not not making the team, but are they going to lean on him and rely on him? They have openly talked about they want guys to get the ball. He was drafted by this team to be a ball hawk corner because he showed that skill set at Mississippi State. And so they overlooked his size and they went after big play ability. He's going to have to show that to this coaching staff to maintain, I think, the confidence in him to do it. So I'm watching that position group very closely, and I'll be watching the offensive line as well. There's an expectation, at least I have, that some of the players who are expected to emerge as starters for week one, say Andrew Wiley or Brandon Coleman, I don't know if either of them are going to play uh, due to injuries that they've had in recent days. So how much we see of the offensive line will be interesting. And then how much this team actually shows. I mean, what they're trying to do continues to hide you know, who they are, what they intend to do, what formations they're going to use, because nobody knows what it's going to be. So I do expect a very, very vanilla look and just give some guys an opportunity to get dressed, get loose, get ready for game day, get out there, uh, run a few plays, get used to playing a little bit of football again, and then pack it up, stay healthy, get back home and get ready for a trip to Miami in the middle of next week. And we'll have a full recap of the game against the uh, Jets on Monday. Brand Buster Show, ESPN 630, the Sports Capital.